benchmarking. So you've just written some code and you want to see how fast it actually runs because you're working on a section that's rather performance critical or you're testing out this new kind of technique that you've just learned about but you want to compare the performance of that to the way that you used to do it in the past and see which way is faster. How, how do you do that in C++? So unfortunately there's no right answer really to benchmarking because there's so many different ways to do it and everyone has their own kind of way of actually measuring performance because it's such a touchy subject, you know? If you do it in the wrong way, then maybe the fact that you're measuring the performance itself is gonna add overhead to it. Some people like to rely on third-party profiling tools. Some people like to actually instrument their code and add things like timers to them. Some people like to just run their program and just enclose the whole program in kind of a timer and just write a specific program for testing what, what it is that they want to test. There's just so many different ways that you can actually do this. So what's the right way? Well, I of course don't have a right way, but I have the way that I do it. And that's what I'm going to share with you guys today. We're going to talk about how we can actually measure the performance of C++ code. I just want to point out as well that the topic of benchmarking is much more than the tools that you use to actually benchmark your code. If you're trying to measure performance of a piece of C++ code, that itself requires you to actually do that quote unquote properly. There's many different ways to do that as well. I don't really want to get into them in this video, but I think what I will do is make a video and I'll link it up there when it's made of just like a bunch of tips basically that I have for just ensuring that the performance that you like when you actually run your program and you're measuring the performance, you're actually doing it in a way that the results are going to be somewhat meaningful because there's just so many things to consider when you're actually kind of preparing your code. Uh, for benchmarking. So the first thing we're gonna do is write some code that we actually want to test. So I'm going to do something very simple. I'm gonna have this value, and then I'm gonna have a for loop which just increments the value, like, you know, a lot of times. Let's just say like a million times. So this is gonna be value plus equals. We'll just increment it by two. And then finally, what I'll do is actually print that value into the console. I'll stick a breakpoint here. Now this is a Visual Studio. This is kind of a Windows only function, but all it's gonna do is break the compiler here so that I don't have to like, insert some code here and then put a breakpoint myself. So if we run that, what we should get is just a little program that will print the value basically two times that. So here it is, right? There's our value, fantastic. So now that we've got that, we want to actually analyze how fast our code is. So the way that I like to do this is basically to create a simple kind of scoped based timer. Now I do have a video about timing in C++, which you can also check out. And this is gonna be uh, basically something of the sort. So we're just gonna make a class up here called timer. And usually, of course, I would keep this in some sort of library. We're gonna rely on Prono for this. The constructor is going to actually start the timer. So what we'll do is we'll keep track of uh, the time point that we get from the high resolution clock. So this piece of code gets the current time as a specific time point. You can see it's an std chrono time point. So what we're gonna do is store that in a private member variable. So std chrono time point, and it's going to be an std high resolution clock. We'll call this our start time point. And that's what we're assigning into our start time point. Now we're going to write a stop function, but this will be automatically called in the destructor like this, because I want this to be scope based, which basically means that it's tied to the lifetime of the object. So in other words, when this object gets created, we start the timer. When the object gets destroyed, we stop the timer. So this is basically RAII or resource acquisition is initialization. So here we have a little bit more work in the stop uh, method. We'll just use auto here for a lot of these things because they have very long types. So we'll have our end time point and the end time point will just be again the current time. So when we start the timer we take note of the current time of course and when we stop the timer we take note of the current time. So now we'll work out what the start time actually is as an actual value. So what this will be, what we'll need to do here is just time point cast this to our the units that we want to use which in this case because I want to be fairly precise we'll use microseconds but you can also use milliseconds. That's totally fine, it depends on what you're measuring. Um, a lot of the times when you're measuring something, it might be below one millisecond, and if it's below one millisecond and you're measuring in milliseconds, you'll like it's just useless data. So microseconds is just a way for us to actually uh, get some meaningful data if it's really that fine. So we'll get a start time point here. Um, we'll use our start time point to, uh, that's what we're casting into microseconds. This will basically get us the time since like the beginning of time and we'll get the count off of that. Okay, so that's what we end up with. It's a fairly long uh, little uh, 
function here because we need to cast it into the right time and then uh, convert it into, into this time and then actually get the count, which will kind of give us the microsecond count of the start time. Okay, fantastic. And this will, this I, I believe returns a long, long, yes. So that's what the order will kind of be, it's a long, long. And then we'll do the same thing for the end, but instead of doing a start time point, we of course do the same to our end uh, time point, and that is where we stop. Okay, so now we just need to calculate the duration. So auto duration equals end minus start. It's that simple. And of course we should call this end and not stop. Okay, um, so now if we wanted to, for example, calculate the milliseconds because it's in microseconds, uh, all we need to do is just multiply duration by 0 0.001. And that will just give us the microseconds, but in milliseconds with you know decimal points so that we can actually see how many milliseconds that was. So now it's kind of up to you what you do with this data. Um, now, because this is kind of scope based, it will just get destroyed. So what you need to do if you want to kind of do anything here, and what I usually end up doing uh, is actually outputting this data from this stop function into some kind of tracker, which actually keeps track of what has been measured and what the actual results have been. But that's a very large system that actually outputs like all the data as a file and does a bunch of things so that you can actually view it in separate tools and see how long everything in your program took. And if you're like making a game, you'll see how long each frame took and what the functions in the frames were that were expensive. And that's like a whole system and that's definitely gonna be saved for another video. But um, for now, what we're gonna do is just output the duration. So we'll just say, uh, all we'll do for, for this really is just output duration. So that'll be in microseconds. So we can just write like US, I don't really have that micro symbol hand handy. Uh, and then we'll do the milliseconds as well and do milliseconds. In fact, because this is like this, um, I might just do this instead. So we'll do MS and then milliseconds like that. So let's do it all on one line. So that's how many microseconds it is, that's how many milliseconds it is. Okay, cool, so that's it, right? So what we should be able to do is now, basically if we want to time something like this, we can just wrap this whole uh, part that we want to time into a timer like this, right? Now, what I'll do with the value is I'll move the value up here so that we can still access it in our print function, but that's it. We just stick that block of code where we want the timer to start and it will last for the duration of this entire scope. So now let's hit F5 and see what value we get out of our timer. So there's our breakpoint that we hit and you can see that this took 3.69 milliseconds. Cool. Now I just wanna mention here that it's really important to make sure that what you're supposedly measuring is actually the code that gets compiled because the C++ compiler obviously can optimize code and strip certain code out and change your code entirely. For example, we've written this wonderful function here and we're running in debug mode. So what, what I'll do is I'll just kind of put a breakpoint here and I'll right click somewhere and hit go to disassembly. Now this is, this is the sweet stuff, right? This is the actual assembly code that your compiler has compiled your C++ code into and then from that machine code, it's been kind of decompiled back into assembly code so that we can actually see the instructions that our CPU is executing. So if we take a look at what's happening here, we have this for loop, that's not that interesting, but then let's say this is our value. So what we're doing here is what we're really timing, right? Apart from like the overhead from say the for loop is we're, tr we're trying to work out how long it takes to add one number to another number, right? So that add operation is right over here, right? So what we do um, for this code is we move this value variable, that's it right here, into the EAX register. We add two to that EAX register, that's what does the increment, and then we move that EA, the value from that EAX register back into the actual value variable. And then we jump to like a different part in our code. So this actual addition you can see is happening. It's right over here. We can see it in the assembly code, which means our CPU is actually doing it. Now watch what happens if I switch my configuration to release and hit F5. And now check this out. So it looks like there's a whole lot less code. And specifically, if we take a look at this, I mean, well, there's no add instruction anywhere here, is there? No, not at all. It looks like what's actually happening is we're calling this function here, which is that operator, which is our print function. And before we do that, we push a variable onto the stack and that value, look at it, 1E8480. If we just open a program and calculator here and see, that value is 2 million in decimal. So what's actually happened is the compiler has looked at this code and realized that this does not need to be computed at runtime and has optimized it into just figuring this out at compile time. And all we're doing now is printing the value 2 million. We're not doing any kind of increment at all. So my point is that this kind of 
the results of this from our timer, they're going to be completely useless because we're not measuring ad anymore. We're basically measuring how long it takes to print something. In fact, not even that because that timer scope does not include the printing function. So whenever you're actually trying to benchmark something, make sure that you're actually doing the work that needs to be done. You're not just kind of measuring absolutely nothing taking place because the compiler can actually quite aggressively change your code like you can see here. I'm gonna give you guys one last example. What I'm gonna do is measure the performance of a shared pointer versus a unique pointer. Now this is kind of a hot topic that you hear about all the time. Uh, do we have any kind of overhead from using smart pointers? Should we use them? What we'll actually do here is we'll test it out. So I'll include array because I'm gonna do that. And what I'm gonna do is just create a whole bunch of pointers. So I'll create a little class just to test this out. It'll be a vector two class. We'll just have float x, float y. And then what I'll do is I'll create an array of shared pointer. This will be a vector two and we'll create 1000 of them. So just, just 1000, this isn't even gonna be that kind of big, okay? So we have all of our shared pointers here. And then what I'll do is inside a for loop, which goes through every uh, element in that array, we'll actually have to uh, initialize those pointers. So we'll create them. So we'll say shared pointers, i equals std make shared. This is another little thing that we can test, by the way. We have this make shared function, which we've heard is supposedly good, but we should measure the performance of this versus if we just used, if we didn't use make shared, if we just kind of uh, just use new to, to actually create the vector two and then sort it inside a, um, inside a shared pointer. So we'll put a timer here. We don't really want to time the making of the array. So we'll just put the timer here, just closer to our actual code that we care about. And then what I'll do is I'll copy this code. I'll paste it here, but instead of make shared, what I'm going to do is actually uh, change this to be std shared pointer. Uh, vector two, and then I'll just do new vector two, just like that, okay? So now this is kind of the second scenario. And finally, what I'll do is uh, I'll just use a unique pointer instead. So this will be uh, make unique, and I can get rid of this, and I'll obviously change this to be a unique pointer. All right, that looks pretty good. One thing, one last thing that I'll do just so that we're a little bit more clear is I'll um, just label this basically. So we'll have make shared. We will have, uh, I'll call this new shared. Um, and I'll call this make unique, okay? So we have three different tests here. And of course this actual printing is not getting timed because it's outside the timer scope. Let's hit a five and see what we get. Okay, and as you can see, somewhat expected, we have our shared pointers taking more time than our unique pointers, but wait a minute. Look at this, make shared actually seems to be taking more time than new shared. And I can, of course, rerun this program and see if we get different results. Okay, so now make shared looks like it might be faster. Let's run this again. Now new shared is faster, right? So these two seem to be about on top of each other, but there's one vital thing that we're doing here. We're actually profiling this in debug mode, and that's not particularly great for measuring performance because it does a whole lot of extra safety stuff, which take time. So we'll switch our configuration to release, and then we'll run our code. Now you can see we have this whole different ball game. Apart from being a lot faster in release mode, a lot faster, we can also see that make shared is significantly faster than new shared. And if we try and run this again, you'll see that we get fairly consistent results of make shared being faster than new shared. So always make sure that you profile code that is actually meaningful in release because you're not gonna be shipping code in debug anyway. Um, release will strip away any kind of extra fluff that might be done. And you can see that here we get kind of consistent results of what we would actually expect. Now for this example of shared pointers, we're not, I mean, we're not even like accessing the data. We're not even like sharing the data with other shared pointers or anything like that. It's pretty much a, not a very good test, but my point is that is how the timing works and that's how we can benchmark our C++ code. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, you can hit the like button. You can also help support the series on patreon.com forward slash the channel. Thank you so much to everyone who helps support this channel. As I mentioned, I do wanna make that follow up video where I talk about how to actually measure this stuff properly. There's so many little things that you need to know to make sure that the data, the results you're actually getting from this are actually meaningful and not just fake. But until then, I'll see you next time. Goodbye. Thank you.